Okay, uh, as I mentioned, first, as soon as I start the class, I'm going to, for the first few sessions, I'm going to start a visual studio session and create the thing for you just to see how I do it. And then after a while, then I'm going to have things prepared and just open them, okay? So uh, visual studio, I'll open it. Oh, oh, I opened the wrong one, 19, let me just close it. <laughs> I should uninstall this. All right. So starting Visual Studio 2022. Uh, I'm going to create a new project. And we are going to. used to be very fast, but now that it gets connected to internet to check for something, then it takes time. Anyways, so um, we are section B, correct? We are B, right? So I'm going to go to notes for B and select folder. I will create the project for today, which is 0 to uh, September 13th. Make sure you always have place, solution, and project in the same directory. You don't want to have several projects in your, um, in your, um, in your solution. Uh, I don't think I talked about this. So essentially, Visual Studio works it in a solution project uh, um, system, which means you have a solution. Inside solution, you have a series of projects. So imagine you want to create an e-commerce system for a company. If doing so, you need to create a point of sale. You need to create um, a website to do the online shopping. You know how you need to have inventory and, and, and all the stuff like that, right? So each one of these things become a separate project. It, you put them all in a solution. So you have different applications for one thing, and that becomes a solution. So solution is series of projects for certain things. We are only writing a loop that creates five ranks. So for us, it doesn't matter. We'll, one project will do our work. Um, in future, you'll see when I've come to a point that I need to have several projects to show different things happening, you will see that I'm going to have a um, solution with several projects. But in our case, 99% of the time, for you, almost 100% of the time in OP244, you place the solution and project in the same directory. You create it, empty project, con Windows console application. Creates the project for you, and we have an empty canvas to start painting in. Okay, immediately I'll, I'll create a, um, a, a file and do a testing to make sure everything's okay. Uh, one thing that you need to do in your Visual Studio is to always, and any other thing to do in any other company, I've never seen a company that actually wants tab character inside their source code. It's an awful thing. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> tab character is uh, essentially tells to the cursor, that cursor over there that blinks, to jump to next tab position. Okay? Now, based on different platforms, size of the tab is different. So if you have over here four characters for your tab and you program, you send the code to me. I open it on matrix. Over there is eight. Suddenly, the beautiful indentation that you had in your eight to uh, go to, like the, all of them have this thing. So I'm going to go to options, tools, and options. And in the options over here, I'm going to go to the uh, text editor. In text editor, I'm going to go to all languages. You can go only to C++, but I'll go to all languages. I select tabs. I select tabs, and nothing happens. Let me see what happens. All languages. There you go, tabs. And then oh, you make sure that you don't trip and fall. And then uh, I use smart for smart um, indentation. So it, it decides when to indent. I'll set the tab size to 3, indentation size to 3, and insert spaces at all times. Or 
So even if, if you open a file that has tabs inside, it's going to take all the tabs away and replace it with three spaces. Because it's all space, when you move your code from one platform to another, it remains perfectly balanced as it was before. So that's a good way of doing it. And I'm going to click on OK, and we're good to go. So we're going to start our uh, session by, again, including IO stream. And uh, we're going to say using namespace std and int <coughs> main. And in here, I'm going to say C out September 13th. Here we come. OK? So that's my initial tester. And I return a 0 back to operating system saying everything's OK. Control F5 to run the compile and run the application without debugging. It runs, shows the execution, so we know everything's working properly, so we can actually start doing with whatever we want. Okay, we're good down to this point? All right. So let me get into, so uh, the way I, I teach, I actually go into your uh, weekly schedule. I open up the, uh, the notes that you're in, look at the topics, and go through it. Not necessarily it's going to follow the same thing. It, it, from class to class, it will be different. One student asks a question and completely changes the stream of information that is coming in. So although I'll try to always uh, go through the steps of the weekly schedule, but there is no guarantee that I'm not going to talk about some other stuff as I go through it. So um, hopefully, we're going to talk about OOP, object terminology, and modular programming today. Okay? Any questions before we begin? Yes, I am recording. Thank you. All right. So I think but with, this, with, this, with this software that I have and I'm currently reusing, if it pauses, it's going to look like this. So if you see it's paused, remind me to unpause it. Because when we give you a break, I'll put it on pause. And usually when I come back, I forget, and half of the lecture is gone. So. <laughs> Uh, um, careful with that, and thank you. Also, um, I've been asked, where are the recordings of previous sessions that you had? So if you ever want to, I don't know why, but if you ever want to do that, if you go to the organization that you look at your workshops and stuff, it says Fardad's Notes Archive. If you click on these, Fardad's no Notes Archive, you will see that these are all the semesters that we have. So like. 2217. If you come down over here, you'll see these are all the recordings of all the sessions that I had from the beginning to the end. Okay. If you want to like see what I talked about at that time that week, you can just go over there and look at the topic. Maybe there's something else over there. That, yeah. Pardon me. By the time I upload it to YouTube. So I have to go home, upload it, and yada, yada. And sometimes I forget. Then you remind me on Microsoft. Before that, you forgot to do it. And again, the recordings are not a guarantee. See how many times I'm telling you this. There is no guarantee that's going to be recording. I'm just doing it. This is not an online session. And I've been doing this for more than a decade. So um, uh, I'll try to keep up with it it's just for people to be able to review. But don't. Uh, um, don't rely on it. Yeah, don't, really, don't say, I'm not going to go to class. Who cares? Tomorrow I'm going to listen to the recording. And that day, the recording is not there. So, so, yeah. So we talked about object orientation, and we said what is object orientation. So um, when we are talking about object orientation, we said, uh, did we talk about the three things of object orientation, what they are in class? Did we have a chance to talk about it? But very briefly, yeah, that's fine. So that's exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm going to un unbrief it today and talk about it a little bit. So the codes that I'm going to write over here today um, are not going to be for today. So essentially, the code that I'm going to write to show you how easy it is to, to move from a structured programming to an object-oriented program is what you're going to learn in 
next few weeks. So what you see over here is not there yet. So this is not in your workshop. You're not, probably you're not gonna do it in the next even, uh, uh, maybe you're gonna do it, I don't know, in next workshop. So, so again, uh, so I'm just uh, trying to show you how things work um, um, and uh, what does it mean to actually write an object-oriented program. So, uh, one more thing before we continue. I'm going to pause. When I write a program, you notice that up there I'm writing using namespace std, and we are not having dot .h after the thing anymore, after the... Uh, uh, the header file anymore. So essentially when you are saying IO stream, include IO stream, you're asking the compiler to literally go to the file IO stream.h. Literally, this is not, I'm not trying to explain anything. This is exactly what happens. So when you write include, first of all, the hashtag that you write over there, it means you're talking to the compiler, not C++. Anything starting with hashtag is not C code. It's not C++ code. It's C and C++ compiler's code. You are talking to compiler, telling to compiler what to do before starting to compile your code. And what does it mean to compile? You can simply say pass, and I'm going to go to the next person. Is it a pass? What does a compiler do? Remember? Just don't, don't worry, I'm not trying to put you on spot. I'm just trying to uh, get the conversation going, okay? Uh, and I want everybody to think, I'm going to be next. I better s listen to what he says. And if, so compiler checks to see if your program is, is, is correctly written and debug, we do. Compiler doesn't do. <laughs> it's not compi compiler. tells you if there's a mistake in it or not. And if there's no mistake, what does it do? It translates to? Not to the output you want. It tra it, output is your decision. You can write anything. We can write over there, September 13, here we come. Or you can do anything else. So what does it do? into machine language. So why, can, why we don't write the machine language ourselves? Yes. Because it's difficult, that's all, yeah. We could actually, okay? One of the things that we, like, at dinosaur's time, when I was actually studying computers, we, we actually had a course called assembly language. And you're going to have it if you actually go to university for, um, and, and, and continue the thing. So assembly language is essentially, a one-to-one -one relationship with the machine code. So, so the machine code says one one zero one one zero zero one one. That means plus. Okay. For that one, they put a verb called add. That is add. Then, if you want to, then jump. So you write one-line thingy. So add, jump, store, like that. This is assembly language. So for each instruction of CPU, there is a line that you write. Okay. And um, there is no loop. There is nothing. So you have to do everything yourself. And uh, one of the th warnings they give you, like, wait, because it's so powerful and you think, I can do anything, okay? They say, don't get confused. You, you're not supposed to write in assembly. You need to learn only, okay? It's very difficult. You can, but it's very difficult to do so. Therefore, we create a compiler. Compiler compiles the code. Uh, it creates the machine language for us. And then after doing that, uh, we'll see what's going to happen next. I'll talk about it, okay? So not to get off the thing. So the compiler actually... Uh, those hashtags talking to the compiler, telling the compiler to do something before compilation. That translation begins, okay? So what, what include means is essentially open iostream.h, copy the content, paste it where I include it. So literally, it opens that file, pastes it at line one, whoosh, and removes that line and then starts compiling. So any include you write, you are telling the compiler to bring that code in this file. Literally includes it here, okay? It's literally a copy and paste. As define is a search and replace. When you write define this to that, you're saying search for this token, this few characters in my code, replace it with this before compilation. 
That's IPC144, right? Okay, so like a defined statement is that. So you're just essentially talking to the compiler, telling certain things. So, yeah. And then we say using namespace std. What is a namespace? Namespace is essentially oh, a space for names. So um, when we are programming, the, did I talk, I talked about the three main things that object orientation does, right? Did I, and I, did I mention what are the other two things that is not essentially up for object orientation, but anyways, so let's say you are working in the HR department of Seneca College and you are working in the education part of Seneca College. Okay, now, question. What is a student to you as HR's point of view? Now, what does it do? Like, like, and if like HR is human resources, right? People who hire, right? So what a student is for you? What is a student for you? A client, an employee. Yeah. It has nothing to do, who cares like what like if the student like you want to hire the person in cafeteria to do something. You want to you want the the, the, the like the, the the student to work, you, you need to know how much you have to pay the student, what is the pay rate, how many uh, times he was hired in here, correct? That's what you do. And with education, what is a student to you? Test, courses, what is the GPA? So when you talk to these people, I am talking about a student, name student, and what he thinks, because he's a programmer in the education department, is an entity that has subjects, that has marks for the subjects, and has GPA, and it, it's in certain semester, and so on and so forth. When I talk to HR, a student is a temporary employee that is going to work only for s such and such, and this is the pay rate for it, and so on and so forth. So looking at the same object for different applications, the same object can be complete, can have completely different implementation. Do we agree on this? Right? This is called abstraction. Have you ever been to an, an like, uh, art muse, like the, the art thingy that they had abstract art hanging on the dude, and, and you see there's a triangle with three dots on it, and it says, that's a lady dancing. And I'm like, what the hell? Uh, so that's, that's what it is. So that's essentially, what, like from artist's point of view, a triangle with three dots is a lady dancing. But for me, it's a triangle with three dots because I'm not an artist, right? So it's the same thing. That's why they call it abstraction. From points of view of application, things change. Now, if we are at Seneca College, we want to implement the student. If I want to implement the student as HR, um, we know how to get information of a student. We do it in a structure, right? So we go struct, okay? And from now on, I'm going to call this struct a class, okay? So when I say class, you are hearing struct. Got it? I just want to get you familiar. I want to familiarize you with the lingo, OK? So keep that in mind. And sorry, it's English as fourth language, so sometimes I can't pronounce words. So, <laughs> so OK, so struct. And in here, I'm going to say, what do I say? Oh, student, yeah. Student, and the HR is working on, on this thing. So we have a double. Uh, I'm going to say over here, pay rate, uh, something like that. And I have an integer, hours worked, uh, hours, and so on and so forth, right? I'm not going to go into too much detail. And then the education department wants to create a structure for a student struct. So what do they call it? I already have a student. Aha. Uh -huh. That's problem. That's the problem. The problem is that in one application, I, I can have many different abstractions of the same object. If, if, of, if that's the case, then these two names cannot be side by side. And don't, don't think that I'm doing it in one file. This struct student is in some other header file, some other module. This one is in some other one. They are completely different modules. But at the end, they're going to all get together and get compiled together. That's when it's going to hit the fan. 
right? And not, nobody's aware of it. I'm, I'm writing a student, dealing with student. No, you change your name. No, I want. So you're going to fight who's going to change the name of student to something else. We don't want that. Because of that, we're going to say to the age, first of all, let's do the student over here for the education. So a student, uh, struct student. Uh, so this student has a double GPA. And it has integer semester and so on and so forth. It's just, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so now the people in HR, I'm going to tell them, hey, everybody in HR, please write anything you write in the namespace HR. And people in education, write anything that you are creating and develop, developing namespace in EDU. And now there is no conflict. And whenever you want to create a student for HR, I, all you need to say is HR apostrophe S student, HR's student, education's student, right? Apostrophe S. Apostrophe S in design in C++ is scope resolution, two, sem two, two columns. So you're saying HR's student, so HST, HST. Oh, <laughs> it's not HST, but you know what I mean by HST, right? So that's, so HR, uh, yeah, something like that. And the other one is EDU student, and I'm going to put EST, okay? Now, uh, you notice something new over here that you didn't do with, this, with the structures other than namespaces in C? Do you see anything uh, over here that you didn't do that way? What? I didn't put struct before it. I'm not saying struct student HST. I'm, saying, I'm not saying struct EDU student EST. I'm not doing that. Okay? Why? Because in C++, any class, what is a class? Structure. Any structure created in C++ automatically becomes a new type. It's like integer. It's like double. But it's a complex composite type. It's not like a regular, it's a compound type. Okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a type that is created out of other types. Okay? It's a, it's a compound type. It's not a simple little cutesy type like integer and character and things like that. Okay? All right? So that's that. So that's essentially what names, namespaces are. And because uh, the name, all the stuff that was in C++ before anybody writes a program, all the libraries and stuff, they need to be in namespace too. Maybe I want to create something that's a name that C++ already uses. Because of that, they put everything they had in a namespace called STD. So that's standard. So anything, so in here, for example, if the code I'm writing over here is mostly about HR, I don't want to keep writing HR student this, HR student that, H, I don't want to do that. For that, if I, if I want, if most of the students that I have over here are going to be about HR, what I can do over here is to say using namespace HR. And then I don't need to do this anymore. When I say student, if it doesn't know what it is, first it's going to look at HR to see if it finds it or not. Because I have two usings over here, one is using namespace STD, the other one is using namespace HR. When I say student, compiler says, hmm, what is a student? Let me look at STD. Whoop, nothing is in, is in, is in STD says student, right? Then let me look at HR. Oh, there you go. There is a student over there, okay? But for this student, because I want it to be the education one, then I'm going to put edu in front of it. So there is no conflict. Even if I say, uh, even if I say uh, using name is namespace hr and using namespace edu, both of them, I still can use student, but I have to qualify both of them. Okay? All other things I can use. Yes. Edu scope resolution. Okay, to actually pinpoint which one I'm talking about, to identify them. Mm -hmm. 
then becomes a conflict because it looks and sees, oh, there are two students in a scope now. Which one you're talking about? Therefore, I have to identify them. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and one thing you need, yes, so namespace is literally a space for names. <laughs> like when you want to name things, you put it in a namespace. What is beautiful about namespace is that unlike structures, like when you have two structures with the same name, they collide. You have a conflict, right? When you have two namespaces with the same name, they merge like a bubble and make a bigger namespace. They don't collide. That's why you can continue developing. Like if I'm working in the SDDS department uh, of Seneca College, and we are several programmers, and we all have to follow the same guidelines, we all write our programs in the namespace SDDS because we are in a school of SDDS. But we don't worry about it because all our namespaces are going to merge. And because we all have the same task and a goal and a analyst and code uh, regulations, therefore, there is no problem. And at any place that you get hired, they're going to give you a manual listic. That is the code regulation for that company. Like if you're working for Amazon, you're working for Google. One of the code regulations in SDDS, by the way, you are going to write all your code in the namespace SDDS because you're an SDDS student. Okay. Um, so all your code gets written in the namespace SDDS, but the main module, the one that has the function main, that uses namespace SDDS. You don't create the namespace in the main module. Main module always uses the namespaces that you are creating in other modules. What is a module? It's not either. It's both of them. It's uh, an so it's it's what we uh, technical word for it. It's a translation unit. What the heck that means? <coughs> a module. What the devil is a module? Okay, so. Never in your life, ever, you are going to write an application in only one file. It never happens. <laughs> okay, never. Okay, you have several different files, and they all work together, and they do whatever you are doing. Now, um, um, anybody over here um, pro have problem with colors? No? One in five do? One in five can't see colors. That's reality. I have to ask because if I say green, red, then they, they won't see it. Okay? They're all good? All right. So <clears throat> like previous class, I had to say module one, module two, module three. Now I can actually say, okay, that's okay. I'm just asking. All right. So uh, let me actually go with one, two, three. Maybe somebody's watching your video, right? So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. <coughs> So stupid question. I shouldn't have even asked. I sh should have started right from the beginning like that. So, so um, yeah. So let's say I'm developing an application and need several different modules to do things. Module number one, it has a CPT file. And this applies for C language too. It happens to be CPT because we are teaching CPT. It could be something.c. So this is 1.cpt with 1.h. This is 2.cpt with 2.h. 3.cpt, 3.h, that includes 2.h2. Why? Because it's using some of its functions. Okay? And then I have uh, 4.cpt, that is my main. Okay? So when you compile this on Linux, you essentially are writing GCC 1.cpt, 2.cpt, 3.cpt, 4.cpt enter. When you do something like this, Compiler actually runs to the number of translation units, the number of modules. Each one of these is a module. So first it runs this, it compiles the CPT file, and therefore it will 
compile anything it includes, because include essentially means copy and paste, right? So when it compiles this one, it actually runs and comp uh, compiles this one and sees if there is any syntax errors. It doesn't care if you're calling a function over there as long as you introduce it. So it's as if you're asking me, find out I need help, I'm gonna say, down there in Learning Center, there's a tutor waiting for you. You're not gonna give me an error. You don't know if there's an, a tutor over there. I just compiled your code. You just don't give me an error because you know I told you that and I told you there's a tutor down in Learning Center, so, you, so you, you're okay, you're happy. That's what happens in each translation unit, in each module. It compiles this one. If you made some promises that are some functions somewhere, it doesn't matter, it translates the function calls to machine code, then it does the second one, then it does the third one, then it does the fourth one, and now it has four object calls with lots of promises made. And now comes the linker of C++. So it's another program that gets up the, all the object files and looks for all the promises you made. You said there is a function called foo. Is there a function in, called foo in any other one? If there is none, you're gonna get an error in the linker telling, hey, uh, uh, you said there is a function called yada yada, I can't find it, okay? So if you see some function is not found, that's the linker telling you that, not the compiler. Okay, if you see it says your for loop is supposed to have three things instead of two, that's compiler because it's checking the syntax. Or there is no uh, uh, integer with capital I, you have to put a lowercase i, that's compiler. But if you call certain functions in here and they don't exist, you introduce them, you put it in a prototype, but they don't exist, linker gives you an error. If linker doesn't give you an error, it means everything's good to go. Hacks them all together in one file, one executable file puts it over there. You can throw everything away, the compiler, the linker, and everything. You run the executable, and it doesn't work because you have some logical errors in it. Then you go back, and that endless loop continues and continues. And that's an endless loop. How many updates did you get on your phone? And still you're getting it, right? It's happening again. So uh, mistakes happen, you go back. Problems happen, you go back. Bugs happen, you keep, still keep doing it and doing it. And that's one of the reasons that I always ask you, comment your code. Don't write the story of your life, but comment your code. Mention what you're doing over here. Small titles, very brief explanations. Like when you're writing a loop, that's a loop, but you're saying searching for a student number. Just a small thing. So you're looping through a, a structures of, 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 of students and you're looking for a student number to take it out. The whole thing is doing that you simply write searching for a student number. So that comment is not for someone else, for your teacher to be happy. It's for you after three weeks to come back and say, what the heck did I do over here? And that happens all the time. Your worst enemy in coding is you. They give you a code at a company, you look at the company, you want to say, which idiot wrote this? And you find out it's your code four years ago. Okay? So it, and it happens all the time. Too many. Yes, so that's that. But there is something over here that um, I, I hope that you noticed. Um, main CPP is using one CPP, two CPP, and three CPP, right? So it's including one H, two H, and three H. Not knowing three H is already including two H. So if you look at it, in main, I have two copies of the header file of 2.h. That's a big problem, okay? That's a big problem because you cannot have two, because it's gonna be, if it's, even if it's a namespace, it's gonna be same namespaces with the same name and structures with the same, everything's gonna be duplicated, right? So it's gonna be a problem. How do we fix that? At any moment of time, How do I get out of here? Okay, there you go. At any moment of time that you want to create a header file for anything. So give me something, header file for what? For a workshop. So I am, I am having uh, a header file for workshop, workshop.h, okay? So I'm having workshop, really? Please don't fight, like, <laughs> like employee, student, boss, computer, coffee cup, and workshop comes to mind. <laughs> so, because workshop is good. So let's call it uh, a clock. This is a watch I know, but it looks like a clock on your hands. <laughs> so, so, so I'm gonna say a clock. 
okay? So if I want to write a header file that represents a clock, okay, what do I do? I'm going to say add, and as you see, I'm doing it in header files. It doesn't matter where it be. All the directories you see over here, they are just in one, they are in brain of uh, Visual Studio. They, they are not actually directories on your, uh, on your hard drive. Uh, two files you need to carry your Visual Studio projects are aside. One is vcxproj, .vcxproj. The other one is .vcxproj filters. This is that. vcxproj vcx filters carry this, okay? That's just for being uh, organized and tidy. So I'm going to right click over here. I'm going to say add a header file. New item, a header file. I'm writing a header file for a clock Mo module. Where is it? There you go. Header file. Now in here, I'm going to call it a clock dot h, right? So I create a header file, clock dot h, and I hit enter. As you see over here, it says pragma once, and it's talking to the compiler, right? Pragma once is you going to Wendy's and saying, I want combo number two. It, it means, I don't know, you want the chicken burger with fries and a Coke. But you're too lazy to name the three, so you say combo number two. It's the same thing. So by saying this, you are telling to compiler, compile this code only once. Okay? But we don't use that. We do it manually ourselves. How? I think you've done it once in IPC 144. Okay? But from now on, you're going to do it every single time. Okay? So what you do, you write two statements. You are talking to the compiler. You are saying, if not defined, and then in here you have to put a unique name that represents where you're working and what is the name of the file. Where are you working? STDS, essentially your namespace. What is the name of the file? Clock.h. So you create a unique name with that, and that's a rule that you're going to follow. Every header file you create up to the end of two OP244, and then in your career, based on where you work, it's going to be the same thing. You're not going to write SDDS over there, but yeah. So in here, I'm going to write SDDS, all capital, underline. I use the name of the file, clock, and I'm going to put underline H and another underline. Why? Because I like it that way. I'm the analyst. I'm the boss. I'm telling you to do that. Someone else may give you something else. That's my rule, okay? So you follow that and you write it. To make sure, because that's manual, you have to make sure that you write exactly the same thing again. So what you do, this is what I do. You copy that and paste it. And you come over here, change the second statement to Defined. And then at the end, you say, end if. So remember, we are talking to the compiler. We are writing an if statement for compiler. We are saying, if SDDS underline clock yada yada is not defined, continue the compilation. So compiler compiles over here, and we have created a structure for the clock. So we have struct over here, clock struct. Clock, and this clock of hours has int minute, int hour, int second, whatever, okay? So whatever it has, right? So we are doing this. So it compiles this structure, correct? And it's done. Now, somewhere else, it's included again. When compiler comes in, because the second line of compilation over here actually defines what it's looking for, the second one that it hits this thing to compile, it says, if not defined, STDS clock. But it's already defined because it's been compiled once. Therefore, everything will be skipped right to the end of the end if. It is impossible for this thing to get compiled twice. It will be ignored every single time, every other time that is hit. Are we okay with this? So <clears throat> when you are writing, just a second, when you are writing a header file, an empty header file is this. And of course, namespace, SDDS, and if you see, the prefix of that name matches my namespace, okay? So if I want to write an application for a clock, 
With my eyes closed, first I'll write this in my header file immediately. No question. This is an empty header file. You write, if not define, you write those things. You write define, you write namespace, yada, yada. And if you close it, now you think. Start thinking. This should be in your subconscious. You should do it, you're done, and you do it. OK? So are we OK with this thing? And this is called compilation safeguards. And that prevents this second thing. So the first time it hits 2.c, 2.header file, the 2.header file gets defined. When the second time it's being hit, it's just going to ignore it because it's already defined, right? It's the same thing for, for this one. So that's going to save it. If we don't do that, then you get errors over there. And there we go. Now, another thing you need to know about um, like what we're talking about. So that was the first code regulation that I told you. When you are writing a header file, what are you supposed to do in OP244? That's what it is. And probably in 345, you're going to do the same. OK? But anyways, another thing that you need to do, any variable that is inside the class, what is a class? A structure. Any variable that is inside the class, you have to start the name with M underline. OK? So if you want to call it a minute, you call, you call it M underline minute. M underline hour, M underline second. Going back to my program, in here it has to be M underline pay rate, M underline hours, and M underline GPA, and M underline semester. OK? Why? Because when you do over here HSD dot, and you put over here an M, immediately it's going to list you all the member variables of it. OK? So you can easily know which variable it belongs to this, or later on, you're going you're gonna to see that it might have a hierarchy of stuff. It shows many things, and you don't know which one is what. So like that, it immediately points to you what is the member variable for it. <coughs> Are we OK down to this point? Are we OK? One? Oh, yeah, go ahead. You had a question, too. My apologies. He has to ask first. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I, I ignored his question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my time, I'm very old when it comes to C++. Okay, we're almost the same age. So <laughs> uh, my time, yes, that was the case. But now it works everywhere. But doing su such teaches you what preprocessor directives are. The, all the hashtags that you're writing is called preprocessor directives. And you're going to need to learn how to work with them. I had a friend that is now working for Google. Um, at first, he went to medicine, and then he changed his thing to computers. He's this genius guy, OK? He wrote a header file with only these preprocessor directives that you could compile Visual Basic in C++ compiler. It would translate the Visual Basic to C++. That's how powerful it is, OK? So. Um, not visual basic, basic language. I'm not going to go, like, if, if you don't know what basic language is like from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yes. Actually, the lady first, and then you. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main point is that No. Where is your head? Why didn't you touch his head? Because it's yours. You don't need to. That's the beauty about object orientation. Each property knows its own property. Each thing knows its own property. I know my ear. Everybody knows. So if I, let's do it this way. Let's say, for some unknown reason, this one has hours too. Right? If I say over here, HSD dot M. Why is it now? Am I doing a mistake? Is there something? Oh. Why is it not giving me? Did I make a mistake? 
Sometimes IntelliSense is a little too slow. But anyways, when I say HSD dot M hours, okay, and I say over here ESD dot M hours, oh, what am I doing? Sorry. Sometimes um, I get carried away with what I'm saying. Okay. When I say HSD dot M hours, it's the HSD that belongs to a human resources student. When I do EST dot M hours, although they are the same, but this belongs to an education student. So there are two different things. Because I have ears and you have ears, it doesn't mean they are the same. Nobody's going to, I walk, oh, look at, what is your name? Sorry. Samantha. Somebody looks at my ears, oh, that's Samantha's ears. No, it's yours, <laughs> right? <laughs> no one's going to doubt that, that those are your ears. <laughs> That's the same thing over here. Each object knows its own property using that little dot thingy. Okay? That one. You've done that in IPC 144. Something dot. Yes. So there's nothing new over there. Are we good? Uh, the lady? Mm -hmm. Have them both. Mm -hmm. Of course. No, 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 no. You never know. Oh, like, can you tell me what's included in IO stream? Do you know even where the source code is? Right? That's, that's why we have this, because so many header files may use other things that we are not aware of. And there's impossible for you to actually go and track those things. So th it's the best practice, that's the rule of inclusion. So when do we include? Okay? You include, you do hashtag include when you are using something and it's not defined over there. Other than that, you don't do ever include. So when you are including in another header file, if in that header file there is no undefined thing that is defined in the other header file, you never include it. Usually includes happen inside C files and CPP files. Rarely it happens in another header file, but it happens. As we pro progress through our uh, semester, you will see when. Okay, and I'll show you. I'll see now we have to do this. I'll, I'll, then we're going to talk, okay? And one important thing you need to remember is that the action of using, the keyword using, is never allowed. Actually, you know the answer because you asked the question about other includes. No, it won't make a conflict. It kind of may, because if you have the keyword using in an include, in a, in a header file, somebody including that header file will start using a namespace without knowing. If I say using namespace std in a header file, and you don't know it, you include that header file, right? And you write your code. Assuming that you are not using the STD over here, so you're freely creating stuff that conflicts with STD with no problem. Without you knowing, STD is used because it's in a header file. That's why it's a very bad practice. It's one of the big no-nos of programming. It's like you never use the keyword continue ever. It's as if it doesn't exist. You never use the keyword break ever as if it doesn't exist unless you are using a switch statement. So switch break go together. You write a break in a for loop, you're a bad person. Okay? You write a continue in a while loop, you're a bad person. You are using a go to statement anywhere, you're a bad person. Okay? It means you just went back in time 25 years. You just ignored 25 years of progress. And you know what's 25 years of progress in computer programming? That's like 2,500 years, even maybe more, I don't know. So, so it's huge. So these are one of the big no-nos. So you do not ever use a namespace inside a header. 
Pardon me? No, 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 no. As if, like, continue doesn't create a syntax error, but creates bugs that sh you can never fix in your lifetime. Yeah, okay? Okay. Okay, now I'll ask you a question. Is the name of our school? Uh, school of Data Science and what, anybody knows what it stands for? I really don't know. It's, it's not an example. You'll do it. Okay. Every time anything you do, unless we tell you otherwise. For workshop one, probably you don't do it because, did it, did it, does it say to create the namespace SDS workshop one? Does it? So then you create it in that one too. But if we don't tell you, you create your code for this thing in SDDS. Always. Okay? It's exactly like you're working for an employee, you're like an IBM employee you are and you're working in the HR. And everybody in HR F that writes code in HR, they know that the namespace they have is HR. So they're going to write a namespace IBM.HR and they're going to be in there all the time. That's their namespace. Right? All right, are we good? Yes. Inside a header file. And then so you, you misspelled the safeguards. Like one of them doesn't have underline. One is open, this one is lower case, that's upper case. <laughs> If, if, if your safeguards are written properly, it's impossible. If by mistake I do this, this is not going to work out. If by mistake I do this, that's why I say always copy and paste. This is not going to work out. Because it's checking to see SDDS clock underline is defined or not. But what it's defining is just SDDS clock with no underline. So it has to be identical. If you make a boo-boo over there, it's not going to work out. And um, yeah. So wh 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 when you are doing your code, the codes that are open-ended and we are not instructing, me usually DIYs, when we ask stuff like that, avoid including header files inside another unless you have to. Okay? So don't put the header file in compile and see if it complains that you don't have the header file because, like, you have this thing and I don't understand what it is. So you need a header file, then do it. Okay? But again, uh, like if you are using IO, if you are including IO stream in a header file, remember you can never use the STD. You have to qualify every single thing that is in a header file. Okay, you have to identify it using the namespace sc scope resolution. Okay, we're we're gonna learn all these. As I told you, these are the stuff that we're gonna learn in the next three four weeks, and I'm just giving you a preview. Are we okay down to this point? Questions? We are going much slower than the other class. So next day you are coming, definitely we have a lecture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it's good. It's good. Slower it means we are actually learning. Okay. When there are two possibilities when students don't ask questions. Everything is crystal clear for them or they didn't understand anything. Okay. Crystal clear is like one in a million. <laughs> so usually it's that. So when you're asking questions, I love it. Thank you. All right. So that's that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, so um, and, and uh, let me just uh, save this over here. So I'm going to call this. So as I go through, it's going to be like this. So in here, it's got to be a namespace, space.cpp, namespace.cpp. So we know what we talked about. Then I'm going to go to the next one. I don't know if I actually uh, uh, saved that one. Yes, I did. So now in here, let's talk about, uh, as I mentioned, so let's say in the HR that I have student over there, I have another namespace over here, HR, that is uh, creating a, a professor over there. Okay, so double M salary and whatever, int whatever, <laughs> okay? So, and that's going to be M2, okay? 
as I mentioned, when two namespaces with the same name uh, go side by side or they hit each other, they merge and make a bigger namespace, so, which means namespace HR has two structs, professor and student in it, and EDU only has a student in it, okay? Are we good? All right. So this one we're going to call D namespaces with same name merge dot CPD. All right. Now let's talk about input and output. See what uh, input and output, like a kind of introduction to what input and output is in, in C language, in this clock thingy. Um, I'm going to save it, and I'm going to call it uh, ABC. I'm going to call it clock. Actually, let me just rename that. C. And we don't need this. Oh, did I? Shoot. Okay, cancel. Copy, now close it. No. <laughs> it was C underline, right? And why underline? I don't know. I usually put dash. It was saved. We have it. Okay. Good, so we don't need, anyways. So, next thing. We have uh, two global objects, okay? We have two global objects in, in, uh, in C++. These two global objects, one is made up of a class called OStream. The other one is an instance of a class called iStream, just to put an emphasis on what I mean by instance. I am an instance of a professor. Professor is my class. I am an instance of a professor. You understand this, right? My type is a professor. I am an instance. Your type is a student. Can you believe how quickly I forgot your name? That's one of the things that I wanted to, I just wanted to say, now I know her name, let me just use her name. And I said, shoot, what was it? My apologies, I, uh, I, I think I did make that apology last time too. First, I'm going to murder your names. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm going to forget your names in two minutes. And it's my weakness. It's like my kryptonite. I do not remember names. I'm bad in it. So one more time, please. Samantha. 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 I'm just trying. No, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find the Samantha in my life and see if I can, if I can relate to, like, remember it that way. But <laughs> couldn't find any. Anyway, so yeah. So yeah. So. Student is a, is, a, is a type, is a class, and Samantha is an instance of it. Are we okay with this thing? C out is an instance, O stream is its type. So we have O stream, and O stream is instantiated into a class called C out, into an object called C out. We have an object called ice, uh, a class called ice stream, input stream, and it is instantiated into a global variable, global object called C in, okay? What are the job of these two? C out represents console output. C in represents console input. Anything you insert into C out will be displayed on screen. Anything you extract from C in will be read from keyboard, okay? That's how object-oriented things work. So, <coughs> essentially, I can do something like this. First of all, I'm going to wipe those things up. We don't need that. So, and and th th these are very uh, so uh, th th um, yeah. So so how do, so for example, I say character name. Okay, I put 81 over here, and I'm going to say C out, and I, I'm going to insert in this thing saying hello. Uh, um, what is your name? Okay, so that's going to actually display the message, what is your name? S because I am actually uh, inserting uh, this C string into C out. Again, notice I'm calling it C string, 
Okay? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I'm not going to remember Samantha. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so, 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 hello, so what is your name? And that's going to be C out. So it's got to be displayed on a screen. Then I'm going to extract from the keyboard using an extraction operator. And I'm going to put that one in the name. So it extracts whatever comes from the keyboard, puts it in a name. Did I mention what type of a thing name is? No. C in knows it's a string. So it's going to pick up a string, not an integer number. OK? Of course, an integer number could be a string too. But anyways, but unless somebody's name is 952. I don't know. <laughs> OK, but so, so that's that one. Then I'm going to say uh, C out. And I'm going to say hi, name, how old are you? OK? And now in here, I'm going to have an integer age. Why do you keep telling me change, not saved? Save. OK. Um, and now I can s extract age. Again, I don't need to tell to C in percent %d, like printf. It's not a function. It's an object. It knows how to read. You don't need to tell it how. You give it an integer, it looks at it. It's an integer. OK, I'm going to go get an integer. You give it a string. It looks at oh, string. I'm going to go get a string. So the object knows how to do it. That's what object orientation is. So it's essentially doing the same thing in a different way, right? What does that mean, remember? from last class? Polymorphism. Doing the same thing in a different, airplanes fly, pigeons fly, helicopters fly, they all fly, right? The action is flying but in a different way. So seeing is reading a name, reading an age. They are both reading, right? But it's done different way, okay? So that's that one, age. And then after that, in here I can say, for example, if age is greater than uh, 19, um, welcome to Seneca Pub. <laughs> okay, what is your name? And in here I'm going to say, uh, uh, see out bar. <laughs> okay, what would you like to drink? What would you like to drink? Okay. And now, in the not part of the story, else, I'm going to say security. How does it get out of here? <laughs> OK. All right. So that's what I'm going to So that's essentially what my program is going to do. So I'm going to go step by step and see how it's going to work. So um, how do we do that? It's the magic of F10 and F11. You click on debug, read. What does it say? Start debugging, F5, which means you put some points and you tell it to stop, and you want it to go and stop at that point. Without debugging, you just want to run and see. That's why I say Control F5. Control F5, without debugging, it just runs it. F10, step over. What does it mean? It means if, you, if it... If it's at a line, it runs the whole line. Even if it's a function, it won't go into it. It executes that line. Step into, it means if it's a function, go see what's inside. Start walking through that. And that's, that's how we do it. So I'm going to press F10. And you, when you press F10, because it's not executed, to actually go to the first line, it's going to compile and run it. So I'm going to press F10. And three years later, when it compiles and runs it, OK? There you go. I'm going to put that thing at left, bring this one at right, and we're going to walk through it. OK? So it starts it. <clears throat> I'm going to press F10 again. Name, garbage. Age, garbage. OK? Insert that into C out, and as soon as you do that, hello, welcome, set a couple of what's your name? OK? What's my name? And uh, then after that, it wants to extract something into name. So when I do F10, it's going to stop because now it's extracting from keyboard, right? Now it's waiting for me to enter. Now in here, I'm going to say Jack, OK? And I hit Enter. 
now it's going to say insert hi, then insert name, then insert this. So it's going to insert these three back to back into it. It's going to say, hi, Jack, how old are you? Now it's going to extract the age. So it gets the age. I'm going to say over here 34, and I hit enter, and it's going to say, it's got a couple, oh, not that one. Did I hit that one? Yes, I did. So now it comes over here. The age is 34. And if I highlight this condition, it's going to tell me that the condition is true. So all these facilities of Visual C++ is an amazing debugging and teaching code. So if you just, before you exit, you was, is this condition true? Instead of thinking, and especially when you have a com compound condition that says this and and, like one condition and this condition and braces or that condition, just highlight the whole thing, see if it's true or not. So you can do that. So the condition is true, and after it's true, it's going to say, uh, what would you like to drink? And that's the end of our story, OK? Now, that's how C in and C out works. So you don't need to worry about, what, of course, it has its rules and regulations. And one of the things that of, well, for C in and C out is that they are extremely shy. They get offended so easily, you have no idea. If you tell age to read an integer, and instead of 34, you actually put THIR, start writing 34, C in will not accept that. Not only that, won't talk to you anymore ever. Which means all <laughs> which means all the C ins after that will not respond to you. It's just gonna skip it. Okay? Because you promised an integer and you gave it garbage. Okay? But you can always check, you can ask, C in, are you okay? Everything's good? C in says nope. Then you say, I apologize. You can clean up your mess. Just clean up the mess. So you apologize. You clean up the mess and you continue. That's one of the ways that you write foolproof stuff in object or in, in, in C++. So you try to see in, you ask to see if C in failed. If C in failed, then you're going to say, I apologize. Clear your status. Then you clean up all the mess, then you try again. And you show some harsh message. I asked for your age, you idiot, why you entered something. OK, so, so, so that's how it works. But we're going to learn all that and see out the same way. You don't know how C out might fail because you are printing something, right? But if you try to print something and it doesn't work, C out will do the same thing. It will actually fail to work unless you clear it and fix everything you're supposed to do. The consequences of C out failing is not clear for us. It's, it's a little above our pay grade, um, so we're not going to talk. But C in, you're going to work with it over and over. Every single uh, uh, foolproof applications you're going to write, you're going to talk to C in. C in is going to help you throughout your, your work. So that's that one. Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Yeah, go ahead. No, wait. I told you, three. Like, that's, I think, mid, close to midterm. OK. Well, you want me to teach you everything now? I'll be out of business. <laughs> I have to linger it. Let it go. <laughs> All right. So, so, so we are good down to this point. All right. So we'll stop this. How do we stop it? Stop is somewhere. Stop. There you go. There you go. So it stopped. So this is an uh, introduction to C in and C out, right? So C intro to, oh, not C. Uh, uh, where is clock? <laughs> what happened to clock? <laughs> oh, it's a header file, you gongul. It's a header file. Um, OK, so it is, I'm, right, I'm saving it. So, so, no, so it's D uh, dash, <laughs> D dash, uh, what am I doing? Oh, intro to uh, C in and C out dot CPP, OK? So that's that. So uh, you, you kind of saw what polymorphism is by doing this. Like you just, like you see that uh, I didn't print the, the, the age, but I could simply say, like, but this get out of here, I could simply say, see out, you're 19, you're, you are age, get out of here. So you're age years old. So I can actually print the age seamlessly and transparently. It's going to just automatically print it as it goes through, okay? Uh, 
And this little objects that you see over here, you see that end L over there? That means new line. You could put backslash in over the good old fashioned backslash in. But end line is what we call a manipulator. Manipulator are small objects that mean something to see in and see out. When you pass, pass them to it, they do something to see in and see out. They are manipulators. End L is one of those things. It creates an end of line. Therefore, it goes to new line, okay? So you can either do that or put new line for now. But later on, you're going to learn what manipulators are. There are so many different manipulators. So on the way of reading, you can tell to see in, I want the, like to see out, you can say, I want the width to be 10. I want it to be left justified. I want it to be th this many things and, uh, uh, after the decimal point and then print. So you first pass the manipulators to see out and tell it how to do things. We're going to learn that later on. Actually, that's optional for OP244, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So this end L is the first manipulator that you're seeing. How are you? How are you Long time no see. Uh, okay, but uh, um, it's mine. That's why it's working. It's not Seneca's. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, okay. I'll see you later. Yes. Okay. Ciao. See you later. Thank you. All right, so, yeah, so um, uh, that was a harsh thing to say. I'm a bad boy. <coughs> uh, uh, I think it was my student sometime. <laughs> okay, so let me just, uh, uh, it's actually 12.56, so, and we have like 20 minutes to go. Um, anybody wants to take a quick break? 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 One person doesn't. Anybody? We're good. We can continue. We can? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so what I could do instead of I having an age, if I go back to IPC 144, if I go back to IPC 144, if I go back to IPC 144, uh, can you guys see it back there or it's too small, too big? It, is, you can you? Back, you can see it? You can see it? Okay. All right. Because I want to actually, let me just move it a little to the right and make it bigger. If I, like, if late, later when we go, please remind me on Teams to complain about the lights. Okay, so it can be fixed, so lights and lock. Um, um, so if I, if I want to go to IPC 144, essentially a customer is coming to bar, right? So if that's the case in here, I would actually create a structure, I'm going to call it customer, right? Oh, not like that. Of course, it's going to be STDS, yada, 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 but not for today, okay? So I'm going to create a structure called customer. Well, obviously, it would have been in a, in a header file and so on and so forth, but we're not going to go through that for today. We're just going to write everything here. So a customer definitely has a name. In case uh, they are making an order and I'm about to call their name. And obviously, I need to know their age. Okay, what did I do wrong with this structure based on what I taught today? M underline, yes, that's the name of the thing. So it has to be M underline name, M underline H. Okay. So now in C language, so I want to get the customer's name, right? So, and I want to set this customer's name to something that is coming from entry, correct? So if I want to do that, unlike C language, like if it was C, C language, I would have actually write the code over here. I would have had something like this. I would say, for example, void set name, right? Then in here, you would have customer. I'm not going to write struct customer. Customer pointer C, and you would pass uh, uh, customer pointer C. And then in here, you would say C in uh, uh, I'm setting the name C in into C that points to name, right? That's what you did, right? To actually set the name of the customer. Are we okay with this thing? Yes.
No, just to be able to change it. Because if I pass the whole thing, then I'm going to have a copy of it. I'm not setting anybody's name. That's going to die after set name is gone. I'm passing the pointer to it so I have the address of a customer so I can actually set the name of the customer remotely. Pointers. Review. Review session of IPC 144. Take a look at it. It's at the beginning of the thing, right? So, so but, but no worries. We can fix that. Yes? Of course it has pointers. If C++, yeah, C++ has pointers. Yeah, so, so, but if you want to set my name, say uh, your name is Farhad, I'm going to call you Freddy from now on. So you're giving me a new name. You want to set my name to something else. You don't call a function and put me in it so I become, so you tell me, hey, can I call you Freddy, right? We can do the same thing in here. Unlike C language in C++, I can actually take this thing and put it inside the, the, the structure. And because now set name is inside the structure is me knowing where my ear is. Nobody needs to tell me where my ear is. I know what it is, right? Because of that, that set name has access to all the properties of customer. Therefore, no pointer schmointer needed. Therefore, I'll do this. Done. Right? And I want to set the customer's age, so that's what exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, if you want to set the customer's age, do that. Right? OK? And also, I can tell to the customer to introduce yourself to others. Be friendly. How do I do that? <coughs> introduce yourself. And in that one, it's going to say, hello, my name is name, and I am. Eight years old. Because these functions are inside customer, it has ac they have access to all the things that the customer have. That was called encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. So if I create 50 different customer, each customer has access it to its own name. And I can set the customers to different names and ask each customer to introduce yourself. And each customer will say its own name, not other person's name, because I know my ear. Samantha knows hers, right? <laughs> I remembered. All right, so, so we, go, we good with this? OK, so, it, so if I actually, and not only that, I can actually check to see if the customer is in legal age. So how do I do that in C? We return an integer, right? And we say over here, legal age. And in here, I'm going to say return. What do we say? So I could say, if uh, a m age is greater than uh, or equal to 19, I'm going to return true, correct? Otherwise, so, sorry, return 1. Else, I'm going to return 0, correct? So now, my customer is going to, I can find out what cost, if the customer is in legal age or not. But there is some new type, because people got confused with 0 and 1 for some reason. But what, what is, uh, who's my good friend? Uh, what is uh, true in C? What is true in C? What is pr true in C? So 25 is not true? No, it's true, actually. Nice, we are getting somewhere. So remember, in C language, anything but 0 is true. 25 is true, 1.5 is true, minus 32 is true. The only thing that is false is 0, OK? And that, as you see, became confusing, obviously, right? So in C++, let's say we're going to add a new type. We call it Boolean. Boolean is essentially behind the scene at, uh, an integer, a, a small integer, it's a character, right? It's, a, it's an integer. So if you set Boolean to any value that is not 0, it will be 1 automatically. So if you set a Boolean to 25, it will be 1. If you 
set a Boolean to zero, it's a zero. And uh, they actually created these constant values, literal values. You can actually say T-R-U-E, true. True is essentially means, means true. So, so I could say over here, instead of int, I could say over here bool, and in here I could say return true, just to make it more understandable. And in here I'm going to say false. By the way, this is the worst code that I'm going to write. You write something like this, it's going to be rejected. You just have a go to in here. Go to end of the function, go to end of the function. A function, you're allowed to have one entry, that is its name, and one output, and that's return. You're allowed to have one return statement, not more. Okay? So if you want to write an if statement, which is an awful thing to do, then uh, you should have something like over here, Boolean result, say set it to false. And then in here you say result is true. And then at the end you return that result. That's the proper way of writing it. Okay? That's the private, pr proper kindergarten way of writing it. Okay? You never see a professional programmer writing something like that, ever. Okay? A professional programmer says, you are saying if this condition is true, return true, right? So why are you wasting my time? Instead of all this gibberish, just say return. Done. Every operator in C language returns a value. This comparison operator returns true if this is true, returns false if it's false. Why do I check it with an F? Just read the damn the return the damn thing. If it's true, true is returned. If it's false, false is returned. Why write code? That's good way. This is kindergarten way. Okay? So now we have <coughs> our thing working with, so I actually my customer actually now, and this is in three weeks' time, we're gonna talk about it. I just show you a taste of it. Like, what does it mean to actually encapsulate things? Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, comment this bad part of it. Put it that way. <coughs> and obviously, if I want to actually write a main for this, let me put the mouse somewhere that works. The main is gonna look like something like this. <coughs> I have a customer C, and I'm going to say, <coughs> what is your name? C.set name. And then what is your age? C.set age. Introduce yourself. If it's a legal age, yada, yada, yada. So now it's an object-oriented thing. I'm actually asking customer, are you in legal age? Customer, set your age. Customer, set your name. OK? And not only that, <coughs> so that's E. Uh, encapsulation, okay? Not only that, sometimes <coughs> sometimes you want to set the customer's name, but you don't want to ask him, okay? You're going to be Jack, you're going to be Joe, I want to, I want to give labels to people. Okay, if I want to do that, I don't need to get it from the uh, console, right? I can just set it. First of all, if I want to do that, I need string header file, right? Because I, I, it's a C string. So, inc so include, okay, remember string.h, you drop the dot .h at the end. Anything that comes from C language starts with a C. So you write over here C string. C string is the same thing as st string.h. Okay, so I need that one. Now I want to set the name, right? Do I write another function? No. I write over here void set name, the exact same name, but I'm going to pass a constant character pointer name to it. And in here I'm going to say str copy into m name, the name. Because the arguments of the two 
functions are different, C++ knows which one to call. Which one to call. Okay? That's the basic polymorphism thing that you can do in C. So, so in here, instead of saying, uh, what's your name? So let's call this one Jack. So I can remove this one, and I can say set name. And in here, I'm going to say Jack. Okay? Because I am calling the set name and I am passing a constant character pointer to it, compiler looks, is this the one? No, it doesn't accept anything. Is it this one? Yes, it accepts a name. Let's call that. So doing the same thing in different ways. I am setting the name, one from console, one from entry, hence polymorphism. And that's the second feature of object orientation. Okay? We're going to talk about that all the way through. Okay? So, and the final thing for it, sadly, I cannot give you an example for. <laughs> uh, I cannot give you an example of it because uh, inheritance is much richer than, like, but way too rich for our blood. Um, that's after the break. After the, not this break, study break. So when you come back from study break, we talk about inheritance. We're going to all talk about different types of polymorphism and uh, encapsulation, all different types and shapes of it. Before that, Midterm, after that, we're going to get into uh, um, inheritance, virtuality, and things like that, okay? <coughs> uh, oh, I have lots of time. It's one uh, eleven. <coughs> so another thing that we can talk about over here. So what do we have here? Oh, so, so this one is polymorphism. So I'm going to save it as polymorphism, EF. So that's polymorphism. Let's see if I can get that. Morpheus. All right. <coughs> Next thing I want to talk about here would be this. I want to give you a code so you can go take a look at it. Ooh, you know what I just did? This is section, the other one is section, uh, yeah. Let me copy this, come back over here, go over here and here, and I'm going to I'm going to add another project to the solution. So I'm going to say add. Actually, let's not do that. I'm going to open another one. In your code, I put something that is called modular. If you like, look at this module, it's a program that I have written first in a non-modular way using C language. And then I broke it down into modules with tools and items. So, so essentially, it's a list of items that it gets from a file and shows and everything. So <clears throat> let's take a look at it and see what it is. <coughs> it's going to tell me that it's Visual Studio 2019, probably. Do you want to convert it or not? We'll see that. Yes, upgrade. OK. So let's take a look at it now. So. If we look at this, these are the modules. And if you, well, let's open the, the non-modular one. Oh, that's OP345. We don't want that. 244. Uh, here, D, modular, and that's it. So this is a ginormous program when you look at it. <coughs> It has, uh, as you see, includes standard input output. It has a struct item that has name, UPC price, if it's taxed or not. It has a file pointer. It has a defined statement for the tax and maximum number of items. We've done this in IPC 144, right? <coughs> it knows how to flush the keyboard. You've done that in IPC. I know that for a fact. It gets a string in a foolproof way. Uh, up to certain max length, so there's a function for that. It gets an integer, gets a double, gets a double between limits automatically. There are foolproof logics for getting uh, uh, information from the keyboard, okay? <coughs> it has a yes function that returns an integer, which means it asks for question, would you like to do this? Then you call the function, it waits for a yes and nope. User presses Y, it accepts yes, or N, no, it returns true or false because of that. So uh, it has a, th a function that prints the titles of the items, uh, rows of the items, reads the items from, uh, from file and put it probably in an in a, in a, in a item, 
load the items, sort the items, lots of things that it does. And it has a main program that starts by loading the items, showing a menu, printing the items, search for items, sort them, print it, pr uh, check to see if you want to exit or not, and so on and so forth. And, at, and there all the functions are all here in one file. We don't want that. I broke this down. I said, if we are writing something like this, first of all, I have a main that is essentially a menu and a main and nothing else. It's a menu that sh you display, that's it. You want to list all items, search for items, sort them, or exit the program. And based on the user's decision that what menu is returning, I'm going to either print, search, sort, or exit, right? So that's my main. Then I said, I'm going to put all the input output features of the application inside one module called IO tools. And IO tools of mine does keyboard flush, get string, get int, yada, yada, all these things. And I put all the functions that I promised in here in the CPP file. And I'm going to go through it like that. So as you see, this is just a simple. Uh, program and as you see up here instead of standard input output it's CSTDIO because I, it's in C++ now okay and I put all the functions that I need over there in that one then uh, of course I have that thing up there so it doesn't uh, nag uh, and uh, obviously everything that is related to item I'm going to put it in the item.h including the structure for item so the item class is over there I don't do defined statements. Instead, I create a constant double tax, and I set it to a value, so it becomes a variable. Defined statement is a search and replace. is an iffy thing. You shouldn't do that. We don't do search and replace unless we have to. And I'm going to say constant int max item, so I change those defined statements to constant values to make the program proper. This is my structure, and these are the functions relative to that item structure that I have, all the things that item can do. This we'll talk about later. And then if you come down over here, you will see that all the functions for those things are there. So when somebody looks at my program, it says, I have a main that is supposed to deal with items using IO tools. I don't have a messy application in one thing. I put it in three different modules, main module and two IO tools. It's up there. Go learn it, study it, see how it works. It may help you for your uh, workshop. OK? Yes. Give me a second. I'm going to make that already happen. So what happens in here, I'm going to come over here in NDB. Let me just save everything in here. Uh, I'm not going to actually cancel. Let me save everything like this. Save. Come out of here and save this one too. Now, this is, uh, this is what you are going to do when you are working on your repository. So get used to it. You, after you've done something, you reach to a uh, turning point, some place that you actually want to do something. You right click over here, say tortoise git add. This adds all the files that are not traced by git and adds it to your git repository. So now these are going to be watched by git. Now I'm going to commit, which means I'm going to commit this adding to, the, uh, to my computer right over here. And what I'm going to say over here, I'm going to say, uh, um, September 13 lecture, right? <clears throat> and in here, I'm lazy. I set, I change to commit and push. I always want my. You do the same. If I, you would, you, you should do the same, because it always keeps your repository sync with your computer. If you don't bring your computer to school, no problem. You just log into Git and get all your stuff and you work on your things. No problem. And then you push everything back. So I'm going to say commit and push. It commits to my computer and pushes it up to GitHub, but it says, wait, I can't push. You changed something on GitHub that you did not apply to your repository yet. No problem. First, what you do, you're going to pull, which means I'm going to say, OK, so don't put it on GitHub. First, give me the changes. So it's going to pull the changes. And after the changes are pulled, I'm going to go over here and say, push again. And now everything's going to go. OK? And they are already on GitHub. <laughs> yes? 
Yes, I did something at GitHub that I didn't do on this computer. You can exactly see, and by the way, it, this one is done on Workshop Zero, so you know it. But if I want to know what was the thing that I just did, all you need to do is to right-click on the repository, go toward this Git, show log. Okay? And this exactly shows what's going on. So this was the thing previously. So if I double-click on this README, it shows me left and right. So I changed something in README. What was it? I added the YouTube recording for the other one. That it does. So I can see that light right side it was this, at left side it was this one. So every single change is obvious. And in here, I click over here, it says merge branch, yada, yada, yada. And uh, uh, you know exactly what happened, right? These are the things that I've done. Uh, and the messages over here, um, yeah. Yeah, so every so I can see every single thing that is changed in here too. Okay? If you get a conflict between If there is a conflict, then you have to fix the conflict. That's a little again rich for your blood. If such a thing happens, just copy the thing that has conflict, put it aside, delete the repository, put clone it again and put it in. <laughs> and you're done. Questions? Yes. No? no please go ahead. Samantha. Yes. I don't think you have much of a code. Yeah, you, 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 you. Yes, yes, yeah. It is, if you already pulled, everything's there. You just copied from your, from the repository of, of workshops into your own working repository in workshop zero. Just copy everything. So this is actually an important question. How to work with all the workshops in the, in a, in a, uh, that you get from school? So you clone the workshops repository of school, but don't modify that. Because you don't have write access. It's going to later on be shooting yourself in the foot. So what you do, you created the workshop repo works repository for yourself privately, right? Just copy the new things that are coming to, you, to the workshop into your own repository, then start working on it. Simple as that. No, no, no. When I'm collaborated to the repository, I see everything. I can go over there, see when did you go for lunch. If you actually said going to lunch and committed, I can see that. No, no, no. You just, you just make me collaborate to the repository once, you, and you can see what I did too. All right? Well, you didn't do the SSH. Did you create the SSH? Did you put it in here? Did you put the key in here? Yes. Um, so, so before this, I, I pulled and pushed multiple files. I sent it over and I pulled it uh, so the day before yesterday. Right click. Go to this gate. Oh, go to pull. Wait for it. Auto load, it's there. Manage, that's interesting. I don't know. I, may, I don't know. Maybe you're at school or something. Try that home and see if it's if it's problem. Contact me over Teams, I'll fix it for you. No problem. All right, everyone. Have yourself a wonderful day. Oh, let me stop recording.